One day, wandering around that hospital and hospital grounds, I disappeared from that era and from 2137 up in a still further future date. By what means, who arranged it, who provided the transportation, I don't know. It was obviously a form of time travel, 28th century. And this was in a time period at uh, 2749 to 2751 AD. While many people still believe that time travel is a far-fetched idea that belongs in science fiction movies, a man has claimed he spent two years time traveling to the year 2749 and gave some ominous predictions about what is coming for us. In 2025, martial law was set in in almost all these areas. There was a combination of, and historically speaking, of a nuclear war, World War III, though it was considered a rather brief World War III, but a lot of destruction, and then there was natural earth changes, which were more destructive than the war. Between all of those, there was a great loss of life, a loss of government, a loss of transportation, and of course, with that, you have starvation and other problems. And it went continually downhill. But is his story fake or fiction? Could humans really travel back in time? Who is this mysterious timeline slider that jumps in time? What happens to time-traveling paradoxes? Join us as we dig deep into the compelling tale of a time traveler and his warnings of the dire future of our planet. Our main character is Al Bielek, who was born in 1927 to a pretty average and ordinary family. The thing was, Bielek was no ordinary child. He recalls memories from before he could walk, something that is unheard of in normal children. Not only that, but when he was a baby, Bielek even was able to understand conversations around him. Growing up, Bielek was always a bit self-conscious. He seemed more advanced than other kids his age. His classmates even gave him the nickname Walking Encyclopedia because he was able to retain so much information. Needless to say, Bielek always felt a bit out of place. He never understood why he knew specific things or how he could retain so much information at once. It wasn't until he was 60 years old and watching a film that he began to remember something else entirely. In 1988, Bielek went to watch The Philadelphia Experiment, a science fiction film based on the World War II government experiment of the same name. Watching the science fiction movie, Bielek recalled feeling a weird sense of deja vu, like he'd known all about this experiment already. In the film, the United States Navy attempted to create a device to render their ships invisible to enemy radar. All of the tests were done aboard a ship called the USS Eldridge. Unfortunately, something else happened during the tests. There was a strange green-tinged fog surround the device the day it was activated. It was October 28, 1943, and bystanders watched as the Navy flipped the switch. As Blue Flash happened, somehow the ship and every onboard also disappeared. Everything and everyone on the USS Eldridge had turned invisible. But in the movie, and as told by eyewitnesses, the ship did not stay invisible forever. It reappeared. However, the reappearance had dire consequences. While sailors only suffered from nausea, others were gravely injured. Others suffered and died from mysterious illnesses. In any case, Bielek could not help but feel like he had been a part of the entire scenario. That feeling was creeping Bielek out. He began to have what he could only describe as flashbacks, since the memories were so vivid. Even so, he was not sure if he was losing his mind or not. So, he decided to seek out help. Bielek began looking into New Age methods of memory retrieval, and started to speak with psychics and therapists about the flashbacks. After speaking with people, Bielek began piecing everything together, two years after he had first watched the Philadelphia experiment. Bielek came out with his first exposition, explaining his flashbacks and what he had come to learn from them. What he said, though, raised more than a few eyebrows. He said that his name was not Al Bielek, and that he was not born in 1927. Instead, his name was Edward Cameron, born in 1916. But saying that his name was Edward Cameron was not even the strangest part of his revelation. 
Bielik went on to say that the United States government placed him in the Bielik family to keep a highly classified mission a secret. Amazingly, Bielik, aka Cameron's story, gets even stranger, more eyebrow-raising, and just real enough that people began to believe him. As Bielik's exposition continued, he began to explain how the Philadelphia experiment was much more than a science fiction movie. He said that it had actually happened and the United States government was covering it up. According to Bielik, the results of the experiment were too dire to even imagine. People were skeptical for obvious reasons, but there was one question that had everyone scratching their heads. How did Al Bielik or Edward Cameron get to know so much about a top-secret government operation? Bielik's answer to the question was that he knew so much about the experiment and the cover-up because he was there as an eyewitness. To prove he was there, Bielik publicly announced various secrets revolving around the Philadelphia experiment, things only someone who was there would know. At the 1990 Mutual UFO Network Conference in Texas, Bielek began recounting his story to a live audience. Like any good story, he started at the beginning, when he and his brother were drafted into the U.S. Navy in 1939. In 1939, he and his brother, Duncan Cameron, were drafted into the United States Navy. By the time 1943 rolled around, both brothers were appointed to the USS Eldridge, a ship that was about to change their lives forever. If he got anything through to the audience, Bielik wanted them to understand the severity of the experiment. Bielik explained that the movie was not fiction and actually happened during the Second World War. Some of the top scientists of the time were involved, helping the United States build a device that could potentially shield ships from enemy radar. He went on to say that he was not just an eyewitness, but was aboard the ship when the device was activated. Same as the movie, Bielik explained that some sailors were instantaneously sick while others began screaming. He and his brother did not know what to do during the chaos. So, they decided to jump ship. However, instead of falling down into the water, both he and Duncan were suspended in time, stuck in midair. Then, everything went black. The two brothers then woke up in a strange place, covered in burns from the radiation set off from the device. As Bielik tells it, he had no idea where they were, only that it was a hospital of some kind. They later learned that they were no longer in 1943, but had traveled through time and were in 2137. Understandably, they were very confused and had no idea what was going on. The first sign that something was wrong was that the room had a wall-mounted color TV, very unusual for 1943. They were told by hospital staff that they had suffered severe radiation burns, not from a nuclear attack, but from the radiation found in deep space. Bielik claimed they were told that there were very few surviving cities around the world and no more national boundaries or government. Eventually, the pair asked to see maps of the world and were reportedly stunned by how much it had changed in the preceding two centuries. As Bielik explained, much of California was now underwater, stretching to the San Andreas fault line, and there was not much left of Los Angeles as a functioning city. Many major U.S. cities such as Chicago, New Orleans, and San Diego were gone, while rising sea levels had seen the Great Lakes become one giant body of water, and the Mississippi River widen, becoming 30 miles wide at its narrowest point. In Europe, he said most of England had gone, while the Scottish Highlands and some of Ireland remained. Much of Europe was underwater, even parts of Switzerland. Most dramatically, he claimed that when he asked a hospital technician, he was told that the world's population had plummeted to just 300 million. He said he learned that most of the world's governments had crumbled away by the year 2025. A nuclear World War III killed millions, but, he claimed, far more were wiped out by changes to the Earth. Six weeks later, everything went dark again. Bielik and his brother Duncan were traveling through time. This time, they went even further back, to the year 2749. Looking around the new hospital, Bielik really did not need anyone to tell him he was in the future. He could tell just by looking at the surgical equipment around him. It was unlike anything he'd seen before. 
After his injuries were treated with advanced surgical materials and vibrational and light treatment therapies, Bielik spent the next two years working as a tour guide in Thurith Century. Even so, no amount of time would help him wrap his mind around what he was witnessing in this new world. Because in the 28th century, society had drastically changed. Government, as he'd known it, was a thing of the distant past. The countries of the world had all gone, and instead, most people lived in a series of self-governing city-states. These city-states had no elected or appointed government. Instead, each city was run by an intelligent computer with synthetic intelligence, called the Synthetic Intelligence Computer System that worked telepathically. It was illegal for humans to leave certain zones, and the governing supercomputers had the ability to terminate offending individuals there and then. Bielik claimed he had spoken to the computer and asked it how such a system of governance came to be. He was told that the project had started a couple of centuries earlier around the year 2600. No militaries existed as technology had made conflict practically impossible and everything was now free. Interestingly, that was not even the biggest change for Bielik. What terrified him the most were the massive wars that whipped out a solid chunk of the global population, bringing it from 7.1 billion down to no more than 300 million. The wars that left the world in ruins were between Russia and China, and then another between the United States and Europe. Everything was turned around, and Bielik did not know how to handle it. Not only that, but the technology he'd experienced was behind his wildest dreams. Humans had finally mastered anti-gravity technology, creating floating cities around the world. According to Bielek, cities were suspended about two miles above the ground with the anti-gravity technology. And with city limits and borders being a thing of the past, these floating structures traveled the Earth, controlled by the central computer. However, people did reside on the ground level, beneath these cities. Although, they were considered lower-class citizens. After two years in the very far future, Bielik and his brother experienced another blackout, and time traveled once again. This time, they wound up in the past, in 1983. But they didn't wake up in a hospital this time. Rather, they were in a secure government facility with highly ranked officials. Bielek and his brother disclosed all of the information they learned about the future. But their strange adventure wasn't going to stop with the debrief. There, he claimed he met Dr. John von Neumann, the Hungarian-American mathematician. This is despite the fact Dr. von Neumann died in 1957, some quarter of a century earlier. He convinced the two brothers to return to their original time and stop the Philadelphia experiment from ever happening. After his time in the Navy, Bielek said he was recruited by military contractors who revealed that the U.S. military was secretly adapting alien technology and forwarding research on psychic operations. Soon afterwards, he was recruited to the Montauk Project, a conspiracy theory that alleges that the U.S. government conducted secret projects in Montauk, New York, including for psychological warfare and time travel. He even claimed he was able to travel to Mars on several occasions, as well as to a research station in the year 100,000 BC. But sadly, once he came forward with his wacky theories in the year 1990, Bielik said the U.S. government disowned him. Bielik, who now insisted his real name was Edward Cameron and that he had been living for more than 100 years, believed the government didn't try to silence him because his experiments in time travel locked him into the current timeline. Therefore, he does not believe that he is putting the world in danger by talking about the events that will happen in the future. However, for the same reason, this means that no matter what horrors Bialik has seen in the future, there is no way for people today to avoid them. Is Bialik's story fake or fiction? Now we have no certain answer. But we know that A.I. Bielek isn't the only supposed time traveler to warn of the Earth future. A mysterious social media user who claims to be a time traveler from the year 2858 has claimed to know how the world is going to end. The user, who posts under the username Darkness Time Travel, 
has gained more than 12,000 followers by posting outlandish claims about future events, with everything from wormholes to humans using Mars as a backup planet. But in their most recent video, the user revealed that war with an alien species would spark the end of the world, less than two decades away. The supposed warning claims that aliens have come to Earth in 2023 to take over the planet, but the war apparently won't start until 2024. In the video, the TikTok user claimed, the first war will begin in early 2024 and will end in 2038, with the Earth being destroyed. Captioning the clip, they added, another species of alien saves us, but not the planet. In a more positive revelation, a time traveler from the year 2345 reveals that in the next 20 or 30 years, not only will we have discovered a way to cure cancer and other devastating illnesses, but we will also be able to inject these remedies into people with a simple vaccination. The epidemic we experienced may have sped up their progress in certain ways. We also make dying seem less inevitable and more like a decision. The current state of life extension research will allow us to not only live hundreds of years, if not longer, but also to keep our young bodies for as long as we choose. Many of you may still be alive during my lifetime, therefore, just think about it. You're still in your 20s, but you've lived a long, fruitful life and have accumulated a wealth of knowledge and experience. Plus, you can accomplish all the things that a single normal lifespan just wouldn't let. At initially, there is considerable resistance from those who are concerned about surviving beyond a normal lifespan. But then, perhaps the majority of them will change their minds and start enjoying endless youth. In addition, space travel became popular with the Artemis missions, which returned humans to the moon a few years from now. After the spaceport and lunar base were built, well, after then, everything went according to plan. Even people with less disposable income may afford to take vacations to other worlds like Mars and its moons Europa and Titan. But after all, does time travel truly exist? Time travel has been a fantasy for at least 125 years. H.G. Wells penned his groundbreaking novel The Time Machine in 1895 and it's something that physicists and philosophers have been writing serious papers about for almost a century. What really kick-started scientific investigations into time travel was the notion, dating to the closing years of the 19th century, that time could be envisioned as a dimension, just like space. We can move easily enough through space, so why not time? As Nick Effingham, a philosopher at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom says, in space, you can go wherever you want, so maybe in time you can similarly go anywhere you want. From there, it's a short step to time machines. Wells was a novelist, not a physicist, but physics would soon catch up. In 1905, Albert Einstein published the first part of his relativity theory, known as special relativity. In it, space and time are malleable. Measurements of both space and time depend on the relative speed of the person doing the measuring. A few years later, the German mathematician Hermann Minkowski showed that, in Einstein's theory, space and time could be thought of as two aspects of a single four-dimensional entity known as space-time. Then, in 1915, Einstein came up with the second part of his theory known as general relativity. General relativity renders gravity in a new light. Instead of thinking of it as a force, general relativity describes gravity as a bending or warping of space-time. But special relativity is enough to get us started in terms of moving through time. According to Clifford Johnson, a physicist at the University of Southern California, the theory establishes that time is much more similar to space than we had previously thought. So maybe everything we can do with space, we can do with time. Well, almost everything. Special relativity doesn't give us a way of going back in time, but it does give us a way of going forward, and at a rate that you can actually control. In fact, thanks to special relativity, you can end up with two twins having different ages, the famous twin paradox. 
Suppose you head off to the Alpha Centauri star system in your spaceship at a really high speed, something close to the speed of light, while your twin remains on Earth. When you come back home, you'll find you're now much younger than your twin. It's counterintuitive, to say the least. But the physics, after more than a century, is rock solid. As Jan 11, a physicist at Barnard College in New York says, it is absolutely provable in special relativity that the astronaut who makes the journey, if they travel at very nearly the speed of light, will be much younger than their twin when they come back. Interestingly, time appears to pass just as it always does for both twins. It's only when they're reunited that the difference reveals itself. Maybe you were both in your 20s when the voyage began. When you come back, you look just a few years older than when you left, while your twin is perhaps now a grandparent. My experience of the passage of time is utterly normal for me. My clocks tick at the normal rate. I age normally. Movies run at the right pace, says Levin. I'm no further into my future than normal, but I've traveled into my twin's future. With general relativity, things really start to get interesting. In this theory, a massive object warps or distorts space and time. Perhaps you've seen diagrams or videos comparing this to the way a ball distorts a rubber sheet. One result is that just as traveling at a high speed affects the rate at which time passes, simply being near a really heavy object will affect one's experience of time. This is not a just a conjecture or thought experiment. It's been measured. Using twin atomic clocks, one flown in a jet aircraft, the other stationary on Earth, physicists have shown that a flying clock ticks slower because of its speed. In the case of the aircraft, the effect is minuscule. But if you were in a spaceship traveling at 90% of the speed of light, you'd experience time passing about 2.6 times slower than it was back on Earth. And the closer you get to the speed of light, the more extreme the time travel. The highest speeds achieved through any human technology are probably the protons whizzing around the Large Hadron Collider at 99.9999991% of the speed of light. Using special relativity, we can calculate one second for the proton is equivalent to 27,777,778 ,77 seconds, or about 11 months, for us. Amazingly, Particle physicists have to take this time dilation into account when they are dealing with particles that decay. In the lab, muon particles typically decay in 2.2 microseconds. But fast-moving muons, such as those created when cosmic rays strike the upper atmosphere, take 10 times longer to disintegrate. The next method of time travel is also inspired by Einstein. According to his theory of general relativity, the stronger the gravity you feel, the slower time moves. As you get closer to the center of the Earth, for example, the strength of gravity increases. Time runs slower for your feet than your head. Again, this effect has been measured. In 2010, physicists at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology placed two atomic clocks on shelves, one 33 centimeters above the other, and measured the difference in their rate of ticking. The lower one ticked slower because it feels a slightly stronger gravity. To travel to the far future, all we need is a region of extremely strong gravity, such as a black hole. The closer you get to the event horizon, the slower time moves. But it's risky business. Cross the boundary, and you can never escape. And anyway, the effect is not that strong, so it's probably not worth the trip. Assuming you had the technology to travel the vast distances to reach a black hole, the nearest is about 3,000 light years away, the time dilation through traveling would be far greater than any time dilation through orbiting the black hole itself. The situation described in the movie Interstellar, where one hour on a planet near a black hole is the equivalent of seven years back on Earth, is so extreme as to be impossible in our universe, according to Kip Thorne, the movie's scientific advisor. The most mind-blowing thing, perhaps, is that GPS systems have to account for time dilation effects, due to both the speed of the satellites and gravity they feel, in order to work. Without these corrections, 
Your phone's GPS capability wouldn't be able to pinpoint your location on Earth to within even a few kilometers. Another way to time travel to the future may be to slow your perception of time by slowing down or stopping your bodily processes and then restarting them later. Bacterial spores can live for millions of years in a state of suspended animation until the right conditions of temperature, moisture, food, kick start their metabolisms again. Some mammals, such as bears and squirrels, can slow down their metabolism during hibernation, dramatically reducing their cells' requirement for food and oxygen. Could humans ever do the same? Though completely stopping your metabolism is probably far beyond our current technology, some scientists are working towards achieving inducing a short-term hibernation state lasting at least a few hours. This might be just enough time to get a person through a medical emergency, such as a cardiac arrest, before they can reach the hospital. In 2005, American scientists demonstrated a way to slow the metabolism of mice by exposing them to minute doses of hydrogen sulfide which binds to the same cell receptors as oxygen. The core body temperature of the mice dropped to 13 degree and metabolism decreased tenfold. After six hours, the mice could be reanimated without ill effects. Unfortunately, similar experiments on sheep and pigs were not successful, suggesting the method might not work for larger animals. Another method, which induces a hypothermic hibernation by replacing the blood with a cold saline solution, has worked on pigs and is currently undergoing human clinical trials in Pittsburgh. Moreover, general relativity also allows for the possibility for shortcuts through space-time, known as wormholes, which might be able to bridge distances of a billion light-years or more, or different points in time. Many physicists, including Stephen Hawking, believe wormholes are constantly popping in and out of existence at the quantum scale, far smaller than atoms. The trick would be to capture one and inflate it to human scales, a feat that would require a huge amount of energy but which might just be possible in theory. In addition, note that there's also the troubling question of what happens to our notions of cause and effect if backward time travel were possible. The most famous of these conundrums is the so-called Grandfather Paradox Suppose you travel back in time to when your grandfather was a young man. You kill him, perhaps by accident, which means your parent won't be born, which means you won't be born. Therefore, you won't be able to travel through time and kill your grandfather. Over the years, physicists and philosophers have pondered various resolutions to the Grandfather Paradox. One possibility is that the paradox simply proves that no such journeys are possible. The laws of physics, somehow, must prevent backward time travel. This was the view of the late physicist Stephen Hawking, who called this rule the chronology protection conjecture. But there are also other, more intriguing solutions. Maybe backward time travel is possible, and yet time travelers can't change the past no matter how hard they try. Effingham, whose book Time Travel, Probability and Impossibility was published earlier this year, puts it this way. You might shoot the wrong person, or you might change your mind, or you might shoot the person you think is your grandfather, but it turns out your grandmother had an affair with the milkman, and that's who your grandfather was all along. You just didn't know it. Which also means the much-discussed fantasy of killing Hitler before the outbreak of World War II is a non-starter. In the words of Fabio Costa, a theoretical physicist at the University of Queensland in Australia, it's impossible because it didn't happen. It's not even a question. We know how history developed. There is no redo. In fact, suggests Effingham, if you can't change the past, then a time traveler probably can't do anything. Your mere existence at a time in which you never existed would be a contradiction. The universe doesn't care whether the thing you've changed is that you've killed Hitler or that you moved an atom from position A to position B, Effingham says. But all is not lost. The scenarios Effingham and Costa are imagining involve a single universe with a single timeline. 
but some physicists speculate that our universe is just one among many. If that's the case, then perhaps time travelers who visit the past can do as they please, which would shed new light on the grandfather paradox. Maybe, for whatever reason, you decide to go back and commit this crime of killing your grandfather. And so, the world branches off into two different realities, says Levin. As a result, even though you seem to be altering your past, you're not really altering it. You're creating a new history. This idea of multiple timelines lies at the heart of the Back to the Future movie trilogy. In contrast, in the movie 12 Monkeys, Bruce Willis's character makes multiple journeys through time, but everything plays out along a single timeline. What everyone seems to agree on is that no one is building a time-traveling DeLorean or engineering a custom-built wormhole anytime soon. Instead, physicists are focusing on completing the work that Einstein began a century ago. After more than 100 years, no one has figured out how to reconcile general relativity with the other great pillar of 20th century physics, quantum mechanics. Some physicists believe that a long-sought unified theory known as quantum gravity will yield new insight into the nature of time. At the very least, says Levin, it seems likely that we need to go beyond just general relativity to understand time. Meanwhile, it's no surprise that, like H.G. Wells, we continue to daydream about having the freedom to move through time just as we move through space. Ultimately, daydreaming about time travel allows people to temporarily escape the constraints of the present and indulge in speculation about what might lie beyond the boundaries of time as we know it. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.